All right, great. So I have that it is uh, uh, time to begin and I want to welcome everyone again. This is the community colleges session uh, for the college college civic learning for an engaged Demo democracy forum. And this is forum two, actually of five, and the forum is called Bridging the Divides, Including All Students, Diversity, Equity, and High Impact Civic Learning Pathways. As you probably know, this is day two, and hopefully you've been already enjoying the rich content uh, for this forum. And again, this is the community colleges, and I would uh, just to do a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, first, we're muting everybody um, at, at the onset, but you will have the ability to unmute and we're leaving time towards the end after a couple of presentations to have a dialogue. So please uh, um, feel free to unmute when we get to that to that part of our of our session. Um, I welcome you all to introduce yourselves in the chat. If you'll include your name and your college name, that would be great. And we look forward to uh, getting to know you a little bit in the next hour. Uh, and again, if you have any um, questions, then you can either jot them down, save them for the end, or feel free to put them in the chat. And uh, we will try to address them as mm -hmm. we're speaking or, or towards the end. Um, for this session, I am so excited to introduce the, the primary speaker, and he is a colleague, colleague and, and hopefully a, a fast approaching a friend. Um, and his name is Dr. Kurt Hoffman. He's the Senior Vice President for Instruction and Student Affairs at Allegheny College of Maryland. And um, Kurt has some very uh, rich content to share with you. He's got a long history with the college. And um, with that, I'm gonna ask Kurt to take it away. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to share some slides with you. And I believe they're showing up, right, Julie? Okay, I'm seeing a yes. Um, so the first slide here is just to kind of uh, uh, kind of frame what we're what I'm hoping that you're going to get from the presentation. Some practical takeaways um, because I'm from a community college, so I'm always looking for um, what can we do on the ground, what can we do actionable, and um, so hopefully there are some things that you can take away from today. Um, everybody probably knows a version of this the unfortunate reality of what we see in uh, America <laughs> during this time that uh, students don't know a lot about basic civics. And you've probably seen these from the crucible moment. You've probably seen them from a variety of different surveys, you know, things such as they can name more American Idol judges than they can Supreme Court justices, those types of things, which is um, just shocking. So that's the unfortunate reality. The problem, if you look at the literature, is, is um, captured in a variety of terms. Some call it a civic disengagement that is happening. Some call it a civic recession. Um, I think it was an economist said a civic decapitalization of society, um, which obviously sounds bad. But the one that scares me, and I would imagine uh, would scare a lot on this call, is the idea of a citizen-less democracy. That one just took my breath away uh, when I saw it. We all believe, I believe, that um, we know that democracy only really functions when all of us are working together. So we believe it's time to reclaim and revitalize civic education and civic engagement in higher education. So um, we also like in higher education to frame the problem, right? Because that's what we're always trying to address. So this is kind of like remembering the why. Why are we doing this? And this is kind of a lit review of all of the things that um, 
civic engagement uh, benefits our students. The first, you can see academic engagement, success, and social responsibility have asterisks by them. Those are the ones that are most um, often cited. They probably have the richest in the literature base. But we all know, hopefully by now, that civic engagement um, has an academic engagement and success component, what they oftentimes call in the literature, habits of the mind, that it promotes the personal awareness that we're hopefully um, helping students to transform. The critical thinking piece is usually the most obvious piece. Social responsibility, you can see those aspects there. A pluralistic orientation, uh, Hurtado and D'Angelo talked about this in 2012, but I would say now we're looking at the DEIJ work that we're doing. This idea that civic engagement allows our students to build bridges across difference, to engage in people that they may not otherwise engage with. And then the last one, which I think is really, really undersold, uh, and when we talk about civic engagement, is this idea of a future orientation, that our students who um, engage in civic engagement activities are more likely to do that into the future, and it, it can actually inform and shape what they want to do with their lives as far as work. So um, I think that's an important thing that is often not mentioned in the literature. Now, the reason I'm here today is I'm a rural guy. <laughs> My institutions is in a rural area. And oftentimes when we talk about rural civic engagement, it's usually framed in terms of deficiencies. Deficiencies in the research literature, there's not much of it. Deficiencies in things such as transportation. And then what I've seen recently is in describing the rural communities, they talk about deserts. They talk about an education desert, they talk about daycare deserts, they talk about civic deserts and news deserts. Education deserts are defined as if you have to drive more than 25 miles to an institution of higher education, that's considered an education desert. Well, that's pretty much all of rural America and it's definitely true for Allegheny College, Maryland. And daycare deserts, we only have five in our county. So you can imagine the implications of that for our students, but also our faculty and staff. The civic deserts is something that I, I find really interesting and Tufts did a lot of work on this, that there is a lack of civic and, pol and political learning and engagement in rural areas, that um, rural students have about half the civic opportunities that their suburban or urban partners do. So there's less opportunities for students to civically engage. And then news deserts, you can kind of imagine that. We, we have one newspaper and, and it's published five times a week. Um, and you can imagine what the content is. Um, a little bit more information. Well, they also said rural America is less digitally connected than urban and suburban locales. So the desert aspect of our students. Um, the other aspect is who are our students? What are these characteristics that make up the students that we see in rural areas, but also in ACM. And a lot of them overlap with first generation and gen ed. Um, we used to call them also um, non-traditional. We, we got to change that word because the non-traditional is becoming our traditional student. So the word that better captures it is a post-traditional student. And our students are post-traditional in that they're trying to balance family, work, and school all at the same time time and often as single parents. We know that these students are less likely to be matched financially. Their career aspirations don't sometimes jive with higher ed. They can't see the value proposition of getting a degree because they can't see how that will impact their vocation at all. We know that rural students pursue degrees at about 18 percentage points lower than urban and suburban students. They tend to stay closer to home and that means educationally as well as vocationally. Um, and they live in these tight-knit communities that tend to be homogenous. And especially in our area, there is also this um, mistrust of outsiders, whoever is considered to be an outsider or the other. So ACM is located in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. We're about two and a half hours due uh, west of Baltimore, about two and a half hours southeast of Pittsburgh, and like I said, the foothills of the Appalachians. We are in Maryland, the Panhandle, before I moved here from California, 
never realized that Maryland had a panhandle. So at the most narrow point, we are eight miles wide. We are eight miles from West Virginia and eight miles from Pennsylvania. Even though we're in one of the bluest states, in this part of the state, we are incredibly red, incredibly red. We are politically, religiously, and socially conservative. We are more um, similar geographically and culturally to West Virginia than we are to the rest of Maryland. Um, and then to just illustrate this point, our local state delegation actually attempted to secede from Maryland into West Virginia. Um, I think West Virginia said yes. Um, it didn't happen, but there was conversations. So that's the reality that ACM has been operating in this civic space, trying to navigate that. Because for everything that we've tried to do, um, we've had to navigate the political landscape. <laughs> so every decision we had to make was very strategic. So all of these things, as we look at it, these are kind of the challenges. Um, we have unique challenges being in a rural community. I believe everybody on this call has those obstacles and challenges. And even though we have this problem that we're trying to address, um, there is amazing work going on. There's lots of reason to be hopeful and to be inspired. Um, this is kind of inspired from Bernie Ronan's uh, Civic Spectrum that he wrote some years ago. And it was our way to try to understand what is this civic work that we're doing and what do we want to target? And what we wanted to do was target the right side more than the left side, because we felt that volunteering, while good, um, tends to be one-offs and it doesn't lead to what we wanted to accomplish at ACM, which is more of the change and transformation. So we had this graphic to kind of remind us, even though the left side is fine, we want to devote more time and energy to that right side. Um, in our version of 1.0, um, and because I was in grad school, I did a logic model. Uh, you don't have to do a logic model as you begin your civic engagement work. But for us, it was a way to kind of frame what are the inputs that we're putting into this? What are we hoping the outputs would be? And then what's the outcomes that we wanted to achieve? So it was a way for us to start framing those very first conversations. Now, our engagement 1.0 our goal was to develop the civic capacity of the students in the college. That was pretty. Um, uh, that was pretty modest goal, but that's what we were hoping in our first iteration of this work. So what we did is we signed on. We were to the democracy commitment. We were one of the original signatory colleges. The president went to the signing event in New York. Faculty Senate. Uh, generated a letter of support for us being a member of the democracy commitment, lifting up the democracy work. What we then did is got busy doing it. So the first step that we did was we created a steering committee that was for the democracy commitment. Now I'm gonna say that this might be the first takeaway if you're doing this work. What the literature says is that oftentimes the work begins with oftentimes a faculty champion, it could be a staff champion, but the problem with that is if the person leaves the institution. It can then sometimes drop off the table or stop. And so we knew that in the literature and decided to create a committee that had faculty and staff on it. So we were broader based. It is also, it was strategic because it's harder to marginalize a committee of people than one individual. So if it was Kurt's work, Kurt could easily get into trouble and could easily be marginalized. But when it was the democracy commitment, it was harder to do that. We also included staff, and I put an asterisk by it, we strategically partnered with the SGA person because they had the deep pockets. If we wanted to do anything programming, if we wanted to bring in any speakers, if we needed to get software, whatever it was, we knew that SGA had the, had the money, had the bank account. So we partnered with the SGA officer. What we found was that they were looking for opportunities to program. What we could connect them with is faculty who are committed to this and wanted this infused into the curriculum. So our first version of this, this work kind of appeared as co-curriculars because we weren't ready to infuse it into the curriculum. We didn't have buy-in at that point. So we started doing things like documentaries with discussions afterward. Um, with led discussions in small groups about action. What can you do? You just saw this 
issue in this documentary. Now, what are you going to do with it? And then helping students become empowered and feeling agency to go out and do something towards that issue. We did deliberative dialogues, other present presentations and forums. So we did all of those things as co-curriculars. And we had faculty that would send their students um, with the coin of the realm, which was um, bonus points. So faculty would give bonus points to the students to go. We got great attendance, sometimes a couple of hundred of students attending. So that was the deal that we made and it, it took off and it had an energy and a buzz on the campus. We created a slice office, that we called it a center. It was an office that was open. Um, <laughs> I staffed it with an AmeriCorps volunteer. That's all we had at that time was somebody who was here. They left after a year and we had a series of AmeriCorps volunteers with only a handful of faculty that were using it. Once again, we were trying to get some traction. We did create what we called really ambitiously Save the World Fair, which was kind of a capstone at the end of the year where students would present in the college center on their projects, their semester projects in which they did something that would make the world a better place. We also um, borrowed from the TDC, somebody had presented on a democracy wall. We're a small rural community college. Uh, we bought a couple of panels for a sliding um, closet door, painted them with chalk paint, and we put the democracy wall in each building and it would rotate around. And it would say things like, to be a Democrat means, and on the flip side, it said, to be a Republican means. Um, democracy is, and then it just leave chalk there and let students kind of write on what their thoughts were. So it was kind of uh, to promote um, kind of civil discourse. The results were our co-curriculars were pretty well attended. And um, according to the survey that I, um, that I delivered, we made movements on civic attitudes, civic behaviors, and global understanding. Made some good progress on that. We did not move the needle whatsoever on political engagement. What we were hearing from the students are this stuff fits into their conception of doing work that benefits the world, but we don't want to do that dirty word called politics. We want nothing of it. It's crazy. People argue. It's unpleasant. And so we couldn't move the needle there, at least initially. Um, we also did our first version of a gen ed outcome. This is where we start to move to institutionalize it. If we put it in as a general education learning outcome, then it's institutionalized because that means at the end of the two years, every student has to be exposed to it. So moving on to 2.0. Our goal was to institutionalize civic engagement, not just to increase the civic capacity of our students, but let's make it a part of what ACM is. So actually created a center. So it's now two adjoined offices. Um, we put a sign on it and um, I did a reassigned time with a full-time faculty member. So now we had a paid staff position doing it. This person then said, we need to pursue Carnegie classification. And they renamed the center, the College to Community Partnership Center. And they started expanding the work in ways that I could have never thought of doing. So we moved away from the co-curricular pathway, which was kind of our gateway drug into civic engagement work to more about infusing it into the curriculum. We wanted to do civic engagement awards. So we have those now for faculty and staff that have a monetary award. The TDC awards for students who win the um, Save the World Fair actually were sent to TDC conferences. They were sent to NASPA conferences as a way to kind of reward them for their semester projects. The staff release time, I'm not sure I've seen this anywhere else, but because as we're doing this work on the faculty side and with students, some of the staff said, hey, we do civic work, which is equally important, but it goes unrecognized. So the institution drafted a day release in which a staff member can put in to have a day of service in which they devote to something in the community. They have to do a reflection. They have to do what our students would do. What'd you get out of this um, day? Um, what impact did you have? That type of stuff. So our, our staff now get days off not days off, a day on, but away from the institution. We had always done voter registration drives, but then we started changing it to where the students were trained to do it. A student going in and registering other students was much more effective than an old white guy in a suit. Um, we did debate, debate watches, not just a watch, but we had people debrief them. So we were teaching them information literacy, how to find out when um, 
<laughs> politicians sometimes exaggerate and define the truth. And then the one that I'm most proud of is the students fought and we are now, the campus is a polling place. So now they can vote here instead of having to go somewhere in the community. Um, they also expanded the Save the World Fair to Make a Difference Fair, which doesn't sound as ambitious, but this is to work with the local high school. So now the local high school partnering with our college students do a Make a Difference Fair, and then they still have at the end of the year the, um, the Save the World Fair. This is the NSOLVE um, results, not where I necessarily want them to be because you can see 2018, um, the voting rates weren't as high. We don't have the 2020 rates, but I believe that they were comparable. The number to look at is we increased um, our voting rate by 12% because of our efforts. I think that those numbers are even more. I don't like those, those tables yet. I think they're higher. Our general education learning outcomes, once again, this is where really the rubber meets the road. Um, so 2017, you can see what the percentage rate of proficiency or highly proficient. We were not very good at it. We were not very good at it in the classroom. We were not very good at it as far as helping faculty understand what assignments or what projects would fit into this. By 2021, you can see that we split out engagement with issues into identifying the issue and then personal insights. And this is, we're going to have another version of this. And you can see that our proficiency numbers met most of our targets, except for culture awareness. So that's one that we're really now targeting because we're not, we wanted a 70% highly proficient or proficient rate. So we moved the needle. This is where we're, this is where we're hanging our hat, that this increased. Personal awareness went up by 60%. We'll take that. That students can identify issues and that went up by 55%. We're good. 3.0, which is what we're currently in, is personal and civic responsibility, and you can see the definitions there. We have PCR 1, 2, and 3, and basically broke it down to personal awareness, cultural awareness, and civic awareness and community involvement. So we added that civic engagement or that community involvement piece in addition to civic awareness. So um, we're, we don't have the data for this yet because this is brand new, but this is the third uh, version of our general education learning outcome. Very, very important. Now I mentioned we had an office <laughs> that what we called a center and then we really had a center. So thanks to Dr. Diane McMahon, who's been leading it um, as the faculty member. There's a lot of numbers in here. The ones to look at is in 2015, 2016, we had about a thousand student hours. We're now up to 7,000 hours for our students. If you look at um, the number of engaged organizations, we used to say, Nonprofits, we had 36. Engaged organizations, 75. Engaged leaders, 92. If you look at faculty, um, right here, it'd be 33 plus the 40 faculty and staff, we have 73. Where at this time, we only had 26. So we have much more in the faculty and staff side that are helping run the center, helping students, helping get the word out. So we're pretty happy with that. The last slide, just to end, because I think I am hitting my time marks, I am, um, are some things that I'm lifting up that are really about political engagement at ACM. Um, and I think this is where some of the takeaways can happen for other institutions. Uh, we have at the state legislature what they call advocacy days. And that's where they open up the state legislature, they open up the Senate and they open up down at the state capitol. And students from ACM take a bus down there for a variety of career programs that they're in. They are informed of the bills that are going to be going up before the legislature for that se session. They know the bills. They go down and they have booked hours, an hour at each um, representative, to talk with them about how important that piece of legislation is to them and their career and them and their person. So we've had the dental hygiene program go down and talk about health care bills that are going before. And also we had our human services program go down and talk about the importance of mental health. And some of those students in that program were talking about personally their own mental health and what it was like, as well as the importance for them working with their clients. So if you have that opportunity, it's worth the bus trip and arranging that to get your students down there to talk. Candidate forums, we offered the first candidate forum in Western Maryland 
of all the candidates. Nobody had thought of it before the TDC did it. Our students organized it. It was broadcast live on the radio. It's a small area, but it was broadcast live on the, on the radio. They did all the questions. They invited all the candidates. They got them all here. So we're proud of that. They've also generated voter guides, all student generated. Debate watch and debriefs, talked about those. Polling plays, democracy wall. The last one is leverage local politicians. If you're in a smaller area, you tend to know the politicians because you're bumping into them a lot. Use those relationships, leverage them, get them to come out. They're always looking for public, um, public presentations that they can be seen at. I will never forget the walk a mile in her shoe where I am in size 11 high heels right next door, right next to our county commissioner who's in some big heels himself as we walk around the quad for a mile as an empathy exercise for what women go through. This county commissioner and I have a bond that goes beyond anything I know because if he can walk a mile and height red, he had red high heels on, that's impressive. So leverage those local political relationships and in small rural communities, the newspaper will publish anything. Use that as a forum to get the word out and to generate interest. All of this, the whole point is students need those opportunities to practice democracy. That's the important takeaway of that. So considerations, here they are as you're constructing it. That is assuming you are thinking about this for the first time, but everybody I see on the call that I know, this is not the first time you're thinking about it. So I will end there. Kurt, thank you so much. Um, while I, I have some questions, I just can't get the image of you in heels out of my mind. Um, it's not uh, a pretty picture. It's not a pretty picture. <laughs> but uh, I was particularly intrigued and interested in what you've, the evolution of your general education learning outcomes and this uh, uh, 3.0 is sophisticated and um, I'd love to dig into that more, but um, just one question. Over the years, uh, and you've been at, um, at your college for how long now? 23 years as a faculty member and now as a VP. So you you know you know the college you know the people. I know the college. Um, <laughs> over the years, have you changed your view of the importance of civic learning? So nothing I would say has fundamentally shifted, but it's probably what a lot of people feel as well that this work has only become even more important. That when we started the work. We knew the research, but then when you see it in students' lives, you see what it makes a how it makes a difference to them and their vocation. Um, it quickly becomes the reason why we do everything that we do, which is the students. So I think the commitment's only gotten deeper because we know the impacts. When we first started, it was all about convincing people why this was a good thing. You know, people were like, because I, I heard it from faculty, they were the most grumpy. Oh, this sounds like more work. This is more work. You're asking me to do more work. And once they started seeing the level of engagement that students had, the curiosity, the th I would say almost the thirst for it, the wanting to feel like they are in control of something um, was um, contagious. Once faculty saw that, they're like, I'm in. If I can do that and get that level of energy, so I think it then starts to take its own life. So when you see the um, genet outcomes, I, I have nothing to do with the gen ed outcomes. That was then the kind of third, second and third generation where they took it and said, this work is so important. We want to make sure that they're graduating with us at the end of two years, that they have a level of proficiency. And it was all faculty generated at that point. So it wasn't me having to do any top down. It was that important to them. Did that answer it, Julie? That was an excellent answer and it just makes me you know and, and just seeing that you you assess it um it looks like on an annual basis is is amazing and you even nuance it based on the changes so um uh, kudos to to you your faculty and and your students for embracing the the work 
Um, I am going to share my screen and provide a little different perspective, but there's a lot of uh, commonality. Um, let me do this very quickly. And this will be a very short um, set of slides. Unlike mine. <laughs> no. <laughs> but they're Yours excellent. Was Yours was perfect. Okay. Uh, and something that I wanted to do and know, knew that I would be uh, having a, a little time to speak is introduce myself. I'm Julie Alexander. I am a higher education consultant and uh, I have had a lot of years in um, higher education in Florida. Uh, particularly with the community colleges. Um, I was the vice chancellor for academic and student affairs uh, for the Florida college system. I then was the vice provost for academic affairs at Miami-Dade College. Uh, and then a short stint at Polk State College uh, where I was the senior vice president for academic affairs and workforce education. And so uh, what I wanted to do is provide you with a little overview of Florida in terms of civics education, civic learning, and, and then take a deeper dive into Miami-Dade College. Uh, so, there are statewide um, requirements in Florida. They have sort of evolved over, over the years. And um, there are statutory requirements, curricular requirements for both K-12 and for post-secondary. At the K-12 level, there is a requirement that students take uh, US government and um, also there, this is a recent development, there is a civic literacy examination that high school students can take. Um, and then I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more with the post-secondary. At the post-secondary level, there is a statewide general education core. Uh, you may be aware that, um, Florida has some pretty strong articulation policies. One of those uh, policies is a common course numbering scheme or taxonomy. And so when we talk about the general education core in Florida, particularly with the civic literacy requirement, we know we can talk in terms of course numbers and we know exactly uh, what we're talking about. Those courses can transfer to any of the institutions, uh, public institutions in Florida. And there, there are a couple of ways students can meet the requirement, either through American government or American history. And there is a new-ish requirement that they uh, take and pass a civic literacy examination. Uh, at first, it was um, uh, going to be based on the US citizenship exam. And then it's, it's uh, taken um, some time to further develop that. And it's a customized examination that is particular to uh, Florida and um, all students must take and pass it in post-secondary. There's also an annual, this is statutorily required as well, an annual survey that um, is uh, attempting to glean uh, diversity and, free, and intellectual freedom vantage points. Uh, it's relatively new as well. And then uh, the governor of Florida has really taken um, civics education seriously and has put some money to an initiative called the Civic Literacy Excellence Initiative. And there are a lot of components to it. Uh, there's faculty or teacher development component uh, through the Florida Civic Seal of Excellence where uh, teachers, K-12 teacher, high school teachers can go through a training and uh, should they complete that training satisfactorily, they will get a seal of excellence that is affixed to their uh, teaching certificate. 
And there is also civics training for teachers, for K-12 teachers. A new development is the introduction of regional civics coaches across the state. There's a common Florida civics curriculum and they're working on enhancements to that. Recently introduced is a statewide initiative uh, and uh, that's focused on debate uh, for students. And then uh, something that is just now in the works is a career pathway uh, K-12 to um, to post-secondary, which is a seamless transition, curricular transition from high school to community college to university through the bachelor's degree and potentially through the master's degree. And it's a career pathway for public service careers. And we're excited to see where that goes. So now let me, I'm, I'm going to talk fast because I really do want us to have time at the end for some dialogue. Now I'm gonna uh, take you, take a little detour uh, and, and take it down uh, to the institutional level and talk about Miami-Dade College briefly. Um, Miami-Dade College in 2015 became an Ashoka U change-making institution or change-making campus. And uh, this uh, initiative at Miami-Dade College has really flourished and become a part of the culture. Uh, this is um, an image of a t-shirt that one of the Changemaker students is wearing. And it is, it is amazing uh, when you can see students wearing this, this Changemaker t-shirt and really um, living up to that definition that you see someone like you who steps up to solve, problem, solve a problem, big or small, for the good of others. And uh, really, what is change making? Um, and it's really helping students cultivate a sense of agency and uh, will to, to do good and make positive change. It's, it's, a, it's a, an amazing uh, message that students understand. A little bit about, about Miami-Dade College, eight campuses, uh, about 100,000 students enrolled on the credit side. It's a, it's a, a diverse um, city, Miami is, and the student population really reflects that with um, about 90% or more are uh, typically underrepresented uh, populations and 67% um, low income, 57% first generation. Uh, the first time I set foot on Miami-Dade campus uh, uh, as the Vice Provost for Academic Affairs, it was evident that this college had a very, very um, strong culture of community. And um, it was uh, uh, an amazing place to be. And what change maker education, it's evolving. Since 2015, uh, there've been a lot of conversations um, that, uh, sort of where, where administrators and faculty sat around a table, scratched their heads and, and asked, what is change maker education? And um, where, where Miami-Dade College has come from is much less like what Kurt described in that uh, he, they started with the co-curricular. Um, really it was sort of uh, one-time events or presentations that that uh, were uh, at the onset of Changemaker education at Miami-Dade. And now there's really a, um, an effort to seep it into the very fiber of the institution and ensure that students have from day one to to the very last day uh, that they are enrolled, an opportunity to uh, have 
continuous engagement and to um, uh, really build, scaffold the, the outcomes uh, that we're looking to, to have at the end of their uh, associate in arts degree, for example. It's really an ecosystem and there is a lot to it. Miami-Dade College is a very big college and it takes uh, more than a village, uh, but the faculty really do drive the process, uh, particularly from the curricular standpoint. There is a team of teams approach, meaning that each of the campuses have a, what we call an impact, what are called an impact team focused on change making. They have an action plan and they uh, monitor the um, progress towards that action plan and report on it every year. It's really built in to uh, how they do business. There are several institutes that are uh, resourced at Miami-Dade College, some for a very, very long time, even before uh, the college became an Ashoka U campus, including the Institute for Civic Engagement and Democracy. It is uh, has a team, and that team does include um, student workers as well. But this team is probably one of the, the hardest working teams at the college. And they bring so much uh, passion that um, that the students, it's infectious really with the students and uh, they do all of the tracking of the student hours and, and all of that. Um, a new institute is the Jaffer Institute for Interfaith Dialogue, which is, uh, we put it uh, sort of under the umbrella of change making education and social impact. And then there's the student life, which is always a, a major part of any student uh, engagement activity. There's one thing I wanted to share with you and I'm almost done uh, is the civic action scorecard. This is uh, this sort of percolated up from engagement between students, faculty, the uh, Institute for Civic Engagement and Democracy. And what it looks like is, is very much what you, what you see here. And it provides students with a very tangible roadmap to um, engaging in uh, community efforts and uh, voting efforts and uh, really serving um, their community. And it's uh, uh, sort of a scorecard uh, where students can document their uh, engagement and uh, they've submitted. And there's a, um, a campus by campus, there's a um, sort of an awards process. Uh, so they're recognized for contributing uh, to the community in this way. We um, went through the process. It's, um, it's uh, open sourced and you can, you can find it uh, just by looking it up, Miami Dade College Civic Action Scorecard, or you can email me and I will send it to you. But it's it's pretty amazing and it demonstrates uh, actually in the scorecard and in a LibGuide for faculty how the general education learning outcomes line up with the uh, demonstration of civic engagement in the scorecard and that's really how um, the faculty sort of uh, ensure that students are meeting the learning outcomes. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing here, and we have uh, just under 15 minutes. Uh, I have a question for you, Julie. Yes, Kurt. Yes. I think I think it would. Um, it's in the chat while you were talking, and it, and it might um, further some of the conversation here. So there were a couple of people that um, were wondering how does the government or the governors for Florida commitment to civics education 
connect to his open hostility to critical race theory, diversity, equity, inclusion, and any mention of intersectionality. If you want to take I that would, one. <laughs> I would say that the, the governor's infusion uh, of um, finance and um, and having this, this civic excellence initiative is more, it's bigger than one person and has the potential for legacy. I think that by supporting and infusing um, both K-12 uh, schools and post-secondary institutions with um, the ability to expand what they're offering to students in terms of civic learning is a is a positive and that's how I look at it and I and I think that um, what's happening in Florida is a a good example of democracy at work and could be um, used for uh, a classroom dialogue so we have, uh, thank you. We have Karen who raised her hand and then I also have a question, I think for the large group from Anne. Karen. Thank you. Um, I just got out of class and we were just talking about this in my social problems class. I'm a sociologist at Schoolcraft College. And in my courses, I require my students to research their professional codes of ethics. And that includes the diversity clause. And so while these parents may believe that they're protecting their children, the reality is, is that they're insulating their children um, from diverse cultures, perspectives, um, sexual orientations and identities, races, and then they go to college. And then they get out there as credentialed professionals um, without knowing how to interact properly and ethically and opening themselves and their agencies and institutions up to lawsuits. So this is definitely a civic engagement issue. And I think that it's very short-sighted and anti-democratic. Um, I'll stand by our academic freedom any day. Thank you for sharing, Karen. Were there any other questions, uh, Kurt, for me? Um, I think it's maybe to the group at large, um, uh, asking about community colleges, and this is Anne from Lansing Community College, and basically when it started, kind of their version of 1.0, um, you know, it was in pockets, um, but they did create definitions and expectations and um, promoted an adjunct faculty to full-time to be a director, and then no movement, and then everything seemed to fall by the wayside. Um, work is hard, you know, there's a lot of it. And then the priorities change, leadership change, and it's just now kind of wallowing. So any ideas on how to pick that back up? I'll start since I'm already unmuted. And I, and I, I think that um, anytime you uh, start an initiative, and, and Kurt, you, you actually uh, described this in your presentation. Start an initiative, implement uh, something new, and you hang that on one person to drive it. There's the potential that it, it fizzles. Um, either that individual fizzles, particularly if they're faculty and they have uh, you know, a teaching load, already, uh, or uh, if it's a, um, a staff member and they happen to either move to, an, to a different position or leave the institution altogether. So I like Kurt's approach uh, to, um, to appoint a committee or to you know invite a committee. Um, and I think that uh, what the president of Miami-Dade College did uh, that ended up having lasting power was to uh, resource a team 
and to bring together the campus presidents and uh, appoint team members uh, of that singular team to the campuses. And so the, these um, civic engagement uh, team members uh, were placed at each of the campuses and they reported to a director that was sort of college wide and that ended up, that infrastructure ended up um, really supporting the work on the campuses of the faculty. I would, that's, that's all, I agree totally. And, and I think the thing to add is to probably approach it like you were a community organizer, um, look at power. Um, what we did is everything we we're trying to do strategically was realizing that um, we had to be careful at first for our institution, but we knew where the power places were and to leverage those. So we knew that if we got into the general education learning outcomes, that has power at the institution. Um, it also helps that you get promoted to be senior vice president because <laughs> then I could put it into the planning documents. I, you know, the very first educational master plan that the institution drafted, this was a major um, initiative for the institution. So now it's codified there. That means that we have people working towards it, advancing it, um, we're held accountable to it, um, and more importantly, institutional resources of space as well as money. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else on the call that um, might have something? as well to add to that. I'll just say that Christina has um, is from Miami-Dade College and Christina, I hate to put you on the spot, but may I and ask you just to sort of share this comment verbally? Uh, sure, I just apologize. I'm on public transportation. I'm on the train right now. And I am a professor in the respiratory care program. And so in the medical uh, campus of our college, we are doing a lot of these things in our curriculum already in terms of compassion and empathy and caring for others. And so I had this opportunity to give the students a chance to reflect, why are you doing these things? Why is it important? and not just for diversity, but for themselves as the ability to understand these are reasons why the tasks are getting done the way they're supposed to be done in the medical field, but also how can you instill that into the community and bring it back because not just doing something because your instructor tells you this is an assignment, but reflect on it. Why is it important for just for example, let's say we're talking about um, understanding the plants in your area. Um, how can that impact? And one of the, the action scorecard items is being able to identify different plants in your area. And in Florida or wherever you may be, you have specific things that are important to your specific environment. So that gives back to being proactive and recycling and caring about the environment. And those are just specific things that I've tried to coordinate with my program in terms of respiratory care, about breathing, smoking, uh, pathology in terms of asthma, emphysema, educating the community. I have certain items that I've added to the scorecard that are specific to my program. Kind of just built really into any program, I think. Christina, thank you so much. I, I uh, really appreciate the very specific examples and it, it really is um, a, a great example being from respiratory care that it, this is not just a general education faculty um, issue or opportunity this this is across the college and um, I appreciate you sharing that all right we have about three minutes and I wanted to be sure to um, share with you all uh, I'm just going to share my screen just to make sure that I do this. Um, oops, oops, there we go. 
At 4.15, you are encouraged to join the next plenary session for Democracy's Future. How can we quicken the movement to make college civic learning inclusive for all? I, uh, I think you will enjoy this session, so please make sure you tune in at 4.15. Uh, but we have a couple more minutes, and I wanted to ask Kurt if he had any final thoughts or um, wanted to share sort of any, any bits of wisdom with the group. <laughs> uh, I, I think I've shared it all. Um, start, start with the committee. Think co-curricular. If you're just starting it out, get it into the gen ed learning outcomes, get it into your planning documents, um, get, get leadership on there because that gives you cover. Um, be strategic. Um, passion goes a long way. However, if you strategic and how you build it, it's more likely to sustain. And the more broad based you can be, the more likely it's, it's to stay. And you have any words of wisdom, Julie? Well, I have uh, probably a, a very uh, big word of, word of wisdom, and that is we have Dr. Cantor, who's joined us for this session, and with the last minute, Dr. Cantor, uh, would you like to share any of your uh, reflections or suggestions for community colleges? Yeah, um, I think I think the um, the pervasive strategy is start with people on the campus that have um, a lot of um, different ideas, but common interest. And I think, you know, what Kurt said is just very important to not do this alone. I think there are ways, this is sort of a, a note to Lansing. Um, you have a lot of foundations, you are, you know, the, um, you know, the, the head of, um, you are the seat of government in Lansing. And it seems like you might get release time for one or two faculty to help with this, like Kurt mentioned, so that you're not asking for more than I think the institution may be capable of giving, but there is quite a bit of COVID money left over. And that might be something that a multi-year investment could could help with, and that does reduce the overall cost. So you have somebody coordinating this, you know, larger committee. And I think, you know, overall, um, what you've all touched upon is the important uh, aspect to this to make it inclusive and campus wide. And that's that's not easy. And I think the student leaders, once things get going, and I think Miami Dade has a lot of strategies and, and, and systemic structures in place that may be able to push against, you know, the political winds of tide, uh, because people are really engaged in that process now, and it's much bigger than any one campus, any one state. And I think, you know, in closing, uh, probably the students themselves have the loudest voice. So I would work through the student government as well. So those are just some reflections. I thought it was very interesting and appreciate all Kurt's work in sharing you know, the guts of, of what could be possible in rural America might be a little easier to do in urban or suburban, which typically have more re resources. Um, so thank you for that opportunity. Thank you. thank you, and thank you all for joining. Dr. Hoffman, thank you for your insights. Uh, again, please uh, sign in for the 415 plenary. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.